Okay, well, I know that you've been discussing uh, uh, science, open science, uh, and how that's consistent with um, initial rigor um, and actually open publishing. Um, and this session, I um, want to open it up and talk about open innovation. Um, I got interested, I was converted to the cause of open innovation when I was uh, raising money for a, um, uh, a small new uh, think tank stroke do tank um, called the Big Innovation Center, whose director is going to speak to you later. And at that stage, what I was doing was uh, arguing that in a country of 62 million people with GDP of um, 1.6 trillion pounds, um, that the numbers of people who think constructively about how innovation happens and what the institutions are that populate it uh, and what the British uh, innovation ecosystem is uh, are absolutely trivial. And then the case for the think tank was to make good that, uh, that, that, that shortfall. Uh, when Birgitta joined the Innovation Center, um, she uh, proselytized uh, about open innovation. And actually, uh, the 11 companies, now 12th, um, that have joined the, um, the Big Innovation Center with some surprising names um, that you wouldn't associate with openness at all, um, like Barclays Bank or BAE Systems, um, have actually, uh, all of them, put their shoulder to the wheel of actually trying to uh, think through what open innovation means why it's an attractive business strategy, um, what the ecosystem is that supports it, and, uh, and what the gains are from it. Um, but the more I've reflected upon open innovation, I think it, um, it goes, for, I'm gonna say a few words more about that, uh, but the more I've thought that actually it's housed in um, a, a culture of high trust and fairness, a real sense about proportionality of reward has to be embedded into um, the, the process of doing it so that there's no sense by any one uh, partner that um, what they're doing is going to be captured or pre-patented or pre-copyrighted or by someone else acting as a predator upon it. And that then leads you, that, that segues seamlessly into some of my, um, some of you will know my work over the decades um, uh, my, my preoccupation with um, stakeholder capitalism, responsible stack, um, uh, capitalism, good capitalism, um, in which the uh, uh, companies are more than simple uh, networks of uh, transactions and contracts uh, between capital and labor, maximizing shareholder value. And they're organized around a business purpose. They have a culture. And actually, companies that survive over time are ones that actually uh, deliver that purpose. You can't do open innovation unless you know your corporate purpose. It becomes to be quite a profound way of actually thinking about how um, not just you do a business strategy, but actually what kind of society and capitalism you're part of. Uh, the reason why open innovation, I mean, again, I, I'll say things which everyone in the room knows, but I, and consequently I won't spend more than a second or two on them. I mean, the reason why um, you know, unexpected um, firms taking an interest in it um, is simply because um, uh, with globalization, um, with um, kind of the exponential growth of, kind of scientific knowledge and more importantly, um, the jumps across scientific disciplines, um, the complexity, the range of options, the, s the speed with which uh, new possibilities opens up um, and uh, worse, actually, the capacity to make a cataclysmic error have just grown phenomenally. And actually, no organization is smart enough um, to manage this um, siloed um, by looking um, inward. Um, but it's often understood by saying, OK, we want to move from you know, think less about the organization, think more about the network. But actually, um, that, itself, that itself doesn't capture um, what one means by open innovation, because you're talking about proactivity within the network. You're arguing, you're saying that actually you've got to go out and look um, proactively uh, for those that might um, join with you in 
kind of co-creating and co-exploring, you yourself have to have in the jargon a high absorptive capacity um, for what they're proposing. Um, and to do that, there has to be an ecosystem of actors who are like-minded, who are as like-minded as you. Um, uh, Unilever, one of the firms that have joined the, open, the, uh, the Big Innovation Center, actually has an open innovation division now um, with an open innovation vice president um, who actually sits on the steering group of the Big Innovation Center. And actually, they've developed a system of, of, kind of open innovation championing um, in which actually they try to specify what um, is the business problem or technological problem or scientific problem that they're trying to solve. And actually specifying it is quite tricky. Um, and then actually deciding within your network who you think is trustworthy enough to, uh, and knowledgeable enough to um, co-create the solution is also quite tricky. So tricky that you can either have um, a group of specialty ex executives who consecrate their lives to it. So if you're in the open science movement in Oxford, or in the open innovation movement and open access movement, be aware that actually you know, corporates like Unilever have you know, divisions and executives making a career um, uh, in, this, in this space. You then have to think about um, that uh, this, this ecosystem is not just about um, a kind of, um, this kind of network through which all these kind of ideas are flowing back and forth. Um, it's also a network which will manage risk uh, the act of innovation is necessarily uh, an act at the frontier um, where you simply are about unknown unknowns. And actually, if you're going to have optimal levels of innovation, you have to have ways in which you uh, distribute and socialize that risk. And that inevitably means you have to have the state uh, and the taxpayer uh, in as a backstop. In my own work in, innova on my own work in innovation, I sometimes challenge people to name one company in the FTSE 100 um, that hasn't had its uh, uh, business model in one way or another um, co-created by public agency. Uh, there's almost no one um, in uh, the frontiers of the knowledge economy uh, uh, who hasn't, ha well, there's nobody uh, who doesn't have that reality. And that leads you to another point about this, that if that is true, that if you want optimal levels of innovation, that actually you have to have some risk distribution, risk distribution, risk mitigation, risk socialization mechanism. Uh, and that's inevitably going to involve um, the taxpayer and public agency. You start, immediately start getting into the question, well, if that's happening, then this information uh, is held in trust for all. It's necessarily part of the common wheel. Uh, so to r arrive at optimal levels of, of, of innovation uh, ha leads to that which leads then to conclusions about how you organize a patenting and a copyright regime. Uh, open innovation necessarily has to have a, ca a capability of actually you know, holding um, information open um, uh, for as long as possible uh, before anybody tries to patent it. And actually, if it is released uh, to uh, a university or a startup or whatever, that actually has to be pre-decided what the terms are on that. And it may even be that actually you're quite happy um, for that startup to actually operate um, with intellectual property without you having any claim on it whatsoever. And indeed, actually, um, Chaz, who's going to speak in a minute uh, from the Structured Genomics, the Genomics Consortium, will explain how you know, his approach to open innovation hangs on just that. Um, the big corporate example, of course, is Procter & Gamble. Um, their share price uh, fell by a third uh, between 1999 and 2001. Uh, they had an R&D spend 7% of total sales, which for those of you who kind of know anything about corporate life is astonishing. Um, but actually, the conversion rate of that R&D into successful products was uh, on their particular metric for doing it around 10%. And plainly, um, there was one business strategy, which was to you know, really um, reorganize that R&D, maybe reduce it. Um, and actually take the cost out. But that actually meant the company, uh, because in a fast-moving consumer products and services, uh, you're always about the new, would actually be dead. And uh, Procter & Gamble invented the strategy uh, of, of open innovation in which they said, OK, um, we've got this R&D spend. You know, what we're going to look for is actually uh, other companies, uh, either our supply chain, SMEs, startups, 
other large corporates sometimes with who will joint venture, license, um, and try and co-create uh, uh, answers to these business problems. Um, well, in 2013, um, <laughs> over half of Procter & Gamble's product range has actually come from open innovation. And it's now become the kind of um, you know, pin-up boy or girl, depending on your you know, inclinations, um, for the entire corporate sector. And Unilever have decided that by 2020, um, they want uh, more than a fifth of their um, uh, products to be done from open innovation, hence this open innovation division and their relation to uh, the big innovation center. But actually, that's just one way of thinking about open innovation. And open innovation is also about um, the relationships that companies have with other companies. It's also about the relationship with, 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 that companies have with their employees. They're kind of, what's it called? The Kenban system, the Japanese system of actually employees kind of advocating ways of, of continuous improvement is actually, if you like, a way of doing open innovation, but actually that's kind of management to employee. And actually you don't do that in highly transactional um, uh, workforces where um, everyone's on short-term contracts or zero contracts. You know, one of the paybacks you get from investing in um, um, staff relationships over time is that actually the, the staff become co-creators with you in actually developing the business model. And it's one of the kind of, um, I'm writing a column on uh, Sunday in the Observer uh, arguing that the Thatcherite Empress has no clothes, um, that the economic transformation that we're asked to genuflect towards as a national community, um, there's been some improvement, but actually, uh, a transformation it has not been, and in certain areas like this, we've actually been knocked back because um, Thatcherite um, proposals on labour market flexibility turn out actually uh, to be counterproductive when you're in this kind of, when you're asking these kinds of questions. Another, another open innovation um, strategy is the one that actually you're going to hear from um, uh, Chaz. Uh, in his research consortium. Another is the linkages that you'll hear about from uh, Birgitta uh, in the way that business and universities kind of, uh, kind of hook up. And of course, there's also trying to do it in a kind of shared geographical space. So, you know, the, uh, the other two speakers will kind of home in in a much more kind of uh, granular way about some of these processes I'm describing. Um, at the Big Innovation Center, we've tried to uh, push as far as we can. We're only a small little um, uh, group of, pe of people and, and, you, and the chair um, spends most of his time in Oxford these days as a principal of Hartford College. Um, but um, we've made a little bit of a difference. The, the, the seven catapults that have been rolled out are being rolled out on open innovation principles um, and the metrics by which uh, the, the government is going to, the department of business um, is going to judge their effectiveness are going to be around open innovation metrics that uh, Big has helped to develop. Um, we're in constant uh, relationship with the intellectual property office, trying to argue that the intellectual property regime should not go down um, the Gower's route of uh, you know, asserting property rights and painting and making the whole thing kind of, uh, kind of unbelievably siloed. I think that one of the um, reasons why the pace of American innovation has slowed down um, over the last de decade to 15 years is actually because of the way which actually um, there's been a kind of kind of what is it, is it rash virus. It's almost it's a it's a kind of over the top um, uh, kind of extravagant commitment to and painting everything that moves. So that painting uh, and copywriting have become business strategies in which you try not only to paint and copyright your own product range, but you try to pre-patent what you think other companies are going to be m moving, so you can block them becomes a consistent it's kind of a game of kind of patent chess, if you like, kind of uh, over time. Um, but it has really frozen uh, um, and made much more expensive um, American innovation. Um, so we try to resist that trend in, 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 in Britain. And we're also trying to kind of push at what kind of the university should look like. And we are, uh, and I am in Oxford, kind of advocates of open innovation, open science, and actually trying to reinvent the, or to try and re protect uh, the kind of enlightenment view of the um, university you know, as, a, as a public institution, uh, creating public knowledge, which is publicly, publicly um, disseminated. Uh, we're also trying to develop a business accelerator built around open innovation principles so that startups uh, and companies that have been established for a year or two 
would actually look to open innovation as the way in which they would um, kind of look for markets and develop their business model. And uh, on an economic commission that looked at the future of the northeast of England published yesterday, uh, I was delighted that the LEP there and a lot of the business community in the northeast of England have actually uh, decided that's what they want to do in the northeast. They want to make it the, no the open innovation region in Britain and Newcastle, the open innovation capital. We'll see, but that's their ambition. Um, but I just want to, con uh, and of course I've, I have ambitions, as some of you know, to try to kind of reproduce this in Hartford uh, by t taking our graduate center and our MCR and try to, as near as you possibly can, which is not that far, but you can do more than we're currently doing, um, to develop a, a kind of graduate school, but college-based, but based around these open innovation principles. Um, I have a series of Skype uh, connections next week talking to potential investors in it, so we'll see how far I get. But I just want to conclude by, by saying, and uh, to kind of broaden this out from the subject of the conference, and you know, David Willits is going to be here in an hour and a half's time, and he'll probably follow through with this to a degree, I suspect, is I, as I, as I do think this is... Um, uh, an invitation to a different um, kind of capitalism. It's not a capitalism which is um, shelled of value maximizing. Um, it's not a kind of capitalism in which remuneration boards kind of set these sky high bonuses for um, executives who have allegedly light bulb moments driving their companies forward uh, around their own individual genius. Um, it's um, uh, it's, uh, not a, it's not a capitalism in which property rights um, are the only game in town uh, alongside maximum amounts of labor market flexibility. This is a kind of capitalism which actually, uh, uh, as I said earlier, but just to ram it home, um, it's about companies which uh, enshrine a business purpose at their core. They don't have that. Um, they don't have a value system and an integrity with actually to commit to these open innovation networks. Um, and that has big implications for how companies are financed, uh, how they're owned, um, uh, what non-executive directors are actually doing when they act as custodians of these companies. Um, it has huge implications for you know, how our universities are, are financed uh, and what we ask of our, and what our research councils should be asking of the research monies that they're putting into our universities. You know, open innovation is, not, is much, much bigger than um, a technique to renew your product range. And it's much, much bigger than actually, uh, to send it to the open science movement, than actually um, getting the results or, or you have the pre-results of your um, work into the public domain uh, earlier than would otherwise have been the case. This is a really big deal. Thank you very much.